I'm Julie Zenner along with Pat Kelly and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Mentor Duluth is hoping to recruit 31 new mentors during its March into Mentoring campaign. Our guests will talk about how you can make a difference in a child's life. This weekend marks the beginning of WDSE's March Membership Drive featuring two new history documentaries you don't want to miss. And we'll have the week's business headlines and a look back at a milestone event in the world 25 years ago. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. Welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. This week's program was recorded Wednesday afternoon as WDSE prepares for the March membership drive. And we welcome back Pat Kelly filling in this week for Denny. Thank you for coming in, Pat. I'm like a robin. I'm a sign of spring. <laughs> but it's uh, always nice to be back in the building. Thank you for inviting me. And if, it, if it's a sign of spring, we're even more excited <laughs> to have you here. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be nice. That in the hockey tournament. So. All right, well, Pat, get us started with our first topic, okay? I will. Thank you, Julie. Mentor Duluth officially kicks off its March into Mentoring campaign Friday with an awards banquet. It's a highlight for a mentor and mentee who have been paired through the efforts of Mentor Duluth. But it is certainly not the main reason adults may want to consider mentoring a young person. Here to tell us more is Josh Nademacher, Marketing and Recruitment Specialist for Mentor Duluth. And Peter Williamson has been a mentor in the program for nearly seven years. Thanks to you both for being here. What, uh, Josh, I'll start with you. What, what's the demand? What is the need for a mentor mm -hmm. in Duluth? Yeah, right now, um, as far as mentees, we have about 200 kids waiting to be matched with mentors. Um, and so basically we um, take interested mentors um, and match them up with mentees based on similar interests, um, things they might enjoy doing together. And um, Peter can, you know, talk, uh, kind of give you an example of that, uh, kind of what that looks like. Too. What, what, does, what does the mentor need? What, what is it you need the mentor to provide? Um, I mean, we, we don't really look for anything specific from a mentor. It's, um, you know, mentors come from all walks of life is kind of what we say. Um, just someone that can be a, a resource, a role model, a guide, and um, you know, a friend to a youth in the community. Mm -hmm. So Peter, you've been a mentor for seven or so years. Yes. Talk about why you first wanted to become involved in the project and what kind of a, a commitment it means. Well, I first got started in mentoring when uh, some people in our church who worked out at Superior Elementary in Superior uh, they were going to start an in-school mentoring program where we would volunteer to go one hour a week. And after we had some experience doing that, we just felt that it would be even more rewarding to be able to do more with the kids than we could in the, just the school setting. And so we got involved with Mentor Duluth. And, uh, We've just continued on since then. My, both my wife and I are mentors. Mm -hmm. Talk about the relationship that you have with uh, young Dakota. Well, Dakota and I, I, I started ac actually at Superior Elementary. Um, he was in third grade hmm. and uh, was about as tall as my waist. <laughs> so, uh, and I've stayed with him all these years and uh, now he's taller than I am. He wants to drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, we play basketball and we've, um, I think what, I, what I've tried to do is uh, try to uh, give him some experiences that he probably wouldn't get in his, uh, he's got a supportive family and, and things like that. I'm not replacing them, but I'm just, trying to do things or think of things sometimes that he probably wouldn't normally get to do, mm -hmm. give him some new experiences and, and just be another adult in his life. I think all yeah. kids need more than one or two. Mm -hmm. Sure, 
Sure, um, the more the better. Yeah. Uh, Josh, what's the screening process for someone who'd like to become a mentor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we start with uh, when an interested mentor comes in, they meet with a staff member and um, just kind of have a conversation, get to know, uh, that's for our, our chance to get to know the mentor, the interested mentor. Um, after that, they fill out an application that, um, you know, it's an interest finder, references, um, just really our chance to see in writing um, what, you know, what a person is interested in, um, what they might be looking for in a mentoring relationship. Um, and after that, they will meet with a screener, um, which um, sounds, I think it sounds intimidating to some people, but it's um, really just sitting down and talking with, with someone about themselves and, again, kind of what they're interested in and um, what they want to get out of their mentoring relationship. Mm -hmm. so. is, is it tough to build a relationship with the, you know, essentially a, a stranger when you begin? Does it take a while to, to really build that trust and become a, a friend? I, it's funny that uh, I, I was very nervous the first time uh, I thought, what are these little kids going to think of me or bigger kids or whatever? And then the first time I met Dakota, this big smile on his face and he, he was just real anxious to have a mentor. And uh, it was just so easy. You know, his, his smile broke out and so did mine and it was just natural. Mm -hmm. What kind of activities have you experienced with Dakota for what, seven years now you've been a mentor to Dakota? Well, we, we've done a lot of, uh, we've gone to baseball games, we've gone to, we try to go to a play every year. Uh, a lot of times Mentor Duluth sets up activities mm -hmm. that we can choose to take part in and we've done that. Mm -hmm. and, but I think the other thing is we've tried to come up with something that we like to do every week we don't have to invent the wheel, so we go to the Y every week and play basketball. That's uh, having something to do every week really helps us keep the relationship. And Dakota and I happen to like Chinese food, so after we play basketball, we'll go splurge at the Chinese restaurant. And hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think having that. Um, weekly appointment really helps our relationship to the fact that I can ask him how school's going and he can tell me what's going on too, so. Do you have requirements as far as how often mentors and mentees get together? Is it once a week pretty common or what do you suggest? Yeah, it's, um, it's really something that is up to the mentor and the mentee's family. Um, a lot of times the mentor is busy with work and the mentee might be busy with school or after school programs or sports in some cases. Um, so what we say is 8 to 12 hours a month um, and that can be once every two weeks, once every week. A lot of mentors will meet once a week at a set time. Some will meet uh, during the weekend and um, yeah, it just kind of depends on, on the case. Mm -hmm. do, do the mentors tend to get involved with the, the child's family too or, or is that really kept separate? Uh, it depends, again, on the, the match. Sometimes they'll be um, involved. And I think if it's a younger child, then it'll be, the communication will be mentor and parent. Um, so, it, you know, texting, phone calls, say, hey, I'm going to pick up Dakota at you know, 4 o'clock on a Monday. Um, so mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Is it part of a, is this Mentor Duluth part of a larger, a regional or a statewide program? How does how does this, what, what's the organization, what's its size? So the, we're a program of the YMCA, the Duluth YMCA. Mm -hmm. um, where we get a lot of our resources is Mentor National um, and then Mentoring Partnerships of Minnesota um, is kind of who we work with to get resources. They're kind of a guide, sometimes work with us um, on recruitment uh, program you know, guides, manuals, so. And it's funded through the Y then? Yeah, the, okay. the YMCA is the main fiscal agent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is there ongoing support for the mentors? I, I mean, I think that that might make people a little bit nervous that they don't know <laughs> what kind of support is, is backing them up in this relationship. Uh, you know, for instance, if something would come up with the child's family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when the mentor comes in, they're always, um, they'll be with a program advocate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a program advocate and there's eight others 
um, who yeah, provide support for the mentor, can answer questions, um, can be a resource. And some, you know, some mentors will come in and they like to have that support. They like to check in often. Others, um, you know, start kind of just are on their are on their way and don't don't necessarily need as much support from the advocate. Mm -hmm. Peter, of course, this is a big drive to get mm -hmm. more mentors. So, uh, how about your um, one minute uh, elevator speech on, on why why someone should consider becoming a mentor? Well, I think if you'd like to do something that will make a difference in somebody's life, this is it. This is one uh, very good way to, to be fulfilled in, in doing that. Um, and I think if you've had kids and you've enjoyed raising them, then you'll love to be a mentor too because it's a, another extension of, of those experiences that you enjoy, you see, your mentee looking at the first time at a play or some experience and and you, it's just like being a parent you're thinking ah, this is really good <laughs> now uh, is there a situation does do you have a mentor and there's one mentee they stay with for x number of years and does that mentor ever be take on another child and is that rare or is that uh, something that's not not rare I would say that's pretty pretty rare to have two mm -hmm. mentees. Um, we have a lot of you know long term relationships similar to Peter and Dakota's, and some um, you know college student will come in and be matched for two or three years, and then they'll be you know off graduate from college and be off um, uh, somewhere else. So mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of short term, a lot of long term relationships. It just uh, yeah kind of depends on. Mm -hmm. um, has there been a, any? studies uh, in terms of the the impact of mentoring on kids uh, and why it's why it's good for them yeah um, as far as specific numbers I don't know That's if I can fine. I can help you out there but you know generally yeah we you know we see the I guess the the impact that mentoring has we're you know we're right there we're talking to the mentors talking to the families um, and so I guess for from our standpoint just the the impact it has on the kids um, out you know, doing things in the community that, that they don't, um, you know, like Peter said, might not have a chance to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, I think from the mentor's standpoint, it, it's a great opportunity for them as well to maybe try new things, um, create a new friendship with, with someone in a, kind of a completely different um, part of their life. Mm -hmm. Where should the mentor go if they're interested in information? Do you just stroll into the Y and say, I'd like to be one? What's, what's the next step for someone, say, watching this show mm -hmm. who'd, who'd like to inquire further? Yeah, you can do that. You can walk into the YMCA. Um, we're actually located in the Harbor Highlands neighborhood. Um, so you can visit our website, mentorduluth.org. You can give us a call at 218-722-4745, extension 120 is our phone number. Um, or Facebook or Twitter is, is another place you can learn about us as well. Mm -hmm. And does it move pretty quickly once somebody makes that call? Yeah, it does. Um, it's it's a kind of an extensive process, but um, you know, I guess thinking of it in terms of, of kind of what you do after you become a mentor, um, the relationship you form with your mentee, I think it's it's a pretty easy process. Pete Williamson, mentor. Josh Nanamacher, mentor, Duluth marketing and recruitment specialist. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Family members of the 477th listen closely as President Bush addressed the nation. This is not a time of euphoria, certainly not a time to gloat, but it is a time of pride. Pride in our troops, pride in the friends who stood with us in the crisis, pride in our nation, and the people whose strength and resolve made victory quick, decisive, and just. What they wanted to hear most was that their soldiers would soon be home. It won't be over for us until they're here, until they're home. Then it'll be over. Leslie's fiance, John, is an ambulance driver in the unit. She hopes Saddam goes along with tonight's ceasefire. 
I'm not sure if I should believe this. We've been through so much and it's got taken so long and it's just unbelievable <laughs> that it can be over already. Sitting next to Leslie is her future mother-in-law, who never doubted the Allies would win this war. Our guys are a bunch of good guys, and they knew what they were doing. We have the technology behind us, and despite what Saddam Hussein says, we have God on our side. Despite her faith, all in this room tonight agreed. The president's words were reassuring, and the best news they've heard in months. March is a significant month in our region in more ways than one. It's the month winter turns into spring and March Madness draws the attention of high school hockey and basketball fans. And it's also the month for WDSE's most important membership drive of the year. This year, two new local history documentaries are a highlight. Steamship America, a North Shore legend, will bring viewers back to the days before the North Shore Scenic Highway was built. And Glen Sheen and the Congdon Legacy explores the history of the Congdon family and their beautiful mansion. Tonight we have a sneak peek of the new Glen Sheen documentary with an excerpt focusing on the house itself. Let's take a look. Glen Sheen's graceful restrained exterior design is a hallmark of Clarence Johnston's work. Yet for all its classic beauty, the mansion's Jacobethan revival facade only hints of the rich details found inside. Chester awarded the interior design contract to the William A. French Company of Minneapolis, a major commission that required the full attention of French. The interior designer, William A. French, he was here constantly. Uh, he actually is repetitively showing up inside of Clara's diary. And so they're, they're having tea, he's showing things, and they're just making decisions, and you know that's ongoing. William French was concerned that he didn't have sufficient financial resources in order to to manufacture all of the furniture in order to stockpile it to get it ready because you know the order had to be placed a year and a half in advance. Chester actually became a uh, the vice president and one of the largest investors in the William French company in order to to ease that cash flow situation for William French. The vast vast majority of the furniture you see throughout this house is all actually custom made for Glen Sheen. A lot of it is actually hand sketched. The sketches are actually then brought to you, usually Clara, and then Clara would say up or down. Elements of Clarence Johnston's interior design mingle throughout the house with ideas from William French, making for a truly unique living space. You'll see a lot of oddities through the house where typically the architect would have a little bit more leeway, but the designers clearly change the design. And frankly, I think that's partly why this house looks as great as it does. And you can definitely tell the Johnson elements and then also in the immediate interior designer elements. Um, you know, the, the very kind of classical Johnson element is our staircase with the leather strapwork design going up. That is Clarence Johnson. It wasn't at all uncommon for when a mansion of this caliber and scale was being built to employ different decorators to do different areas so that you had some variety in your interior design. William French did the majority of the work in the house. He decorated this, uh, this is Chester's room, he decorated this room, for example. But other rooms in the house were, were subcontracted by William French to John Bradstreet. And Bradstreet was probably, in, in many regards, a bigger name than William French was as far as an interior designer. Bradstreet designed the famous green room at Glensheen, a longtime favorite of visitors. It's where the Congdons took their breakfast. Bradstreet was heavily influenced by his many visits to Japan, as evidenced by his craft house in Minneapolis. Here, his clients could see his latest inspired designs. And here, he developed a process of treating wood that gives Chester's smoking room a unique look. I love uh, John Bradstreet's Jindai Stugi process where he actually physically torches the wood. 
he burns off the lighter grains. And so you can really see like the cypress wood, the red and the wood just really pops out. The Jindi Sugi method developed by Bradstreet accelerated the Japanese technique, which required the wood be buried for years to allow rot and decay to dissolve the softer pulp. Also in the smoking room, hand-hammered copper lighting shows off Minnesota craftsmanship, a point of emphasis for Congdon. The overall purpose of Glensheen is to show the talents that we have here in Minnesota. You know, when Glensheen's being built, a lot of people out east didn't know what we had over here. They didn't know we had an outdoor element. They didn't know, you know, that we had a craftsman who could do anything. Of all the rooms in Glensheen, the third floor bedroom of Walter Congdon holds a special place in American design history. And this room here is, is a John Bradstreet room. This is one of the very few, I think it's the only set completely of arts and crafts that John Bradstreet left. But I love that you have the desk, the chair, you know, notice how they all match together. Um, but also, even the wastebasket matches. And I just love that all this stuff fits in together. It's clearly a set. But I also love the, you know, the inlay and the wood in this room. And it's kind of hard to see, but right over here, there's just this, this little decorative design of Bradstreet that is just so, that is one of his signature styles that you'll see on his pieces, only in this arts and crafts. This is one of our greatest things here, is we can still show this time frame of American history, and I would say, really, this is a moment in interior design in our country that is best showcased here at Glenshee. Since his death in 1914, Bradstreet's name has been mentioned with Tiffany, Stickley, and even Frank Lloyd Wright in the pantheon of American designers. His work, along with that of French and Johnston, make Glensheen a unique fusion of American design history. Usually when you have a house of this nature, you'll have one general style that'll dominate the whole house. That's not the case here. You have this third floor, which is very heavy on um, the arts and crafts. On this side, it's done by Bradstreet. The other side is done by William A. French. Well, the floor below us and the floor below that are a Bowles art style, which is a very different style, almost a little post-Gilded Age. Um, you'll also have like Helen's room, which is actually an Art Nouveau style. And so you have these very differing elements that make up Glensheen. Chester and Clara Congdon accented the design elements with fine carpets, objects collected on their many travels, and an extensive collection of art. One of the things that I love about Glensheen from an art perspective is you go into a lot of these grand homes in the country and it's just filled with, you know, really famous international artists. And what I love about Glensheen is you have that, but immediately next to it is a regional artist. Because Chester and Clara weren't buying art just to, as an investment, they were buying art because they actually enjoyed it. They together would look at catalogs of art and, and both would have comments in the notes section of the artwork which pieces they liked. Chester in particular went on this trip through the Pacific and there's a lot of pieces throughout the home that are from that trip. You see a lot of pieces from Australia, Japan, it's kind of fun to see them throughout the house. Even with its artwork, fine craftsmanship, and highest quality materials, Glen Sheen was meant to be a respite, a place to get away from the worries of the world and relax with family and friends. Time now for some of the week's economic stories from the folks at Business North. Product development and financing plans have been modified during the past year at Superior-based Facetto, which has designed a micro-sized portable device capable of storing two terabytes of data. Facetto originally designed its device called Link as a wearable bracelet, but the style received poor media reviews. The bracelet has been replaced by a small cube that can be worn on a belt or stored in a pocket or purse. The company also replaced its crowdfunding financing system with money provided by angel investors. Link is expected to enter the market later this year.
The global investment firm KKR has completed its acquisition of Mills Fleet Farm, which is building a store in Hermantown. The 60-year-old retail chain was founded in 1955 by Stuart Mills Sr. and his sons Henry Mills II and Stuart Mills Jr. It has grown to include 35 stores located throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and North Dakota. KKR manages a variety of investments and owns companies in several industries. Its holdings include private equity, energy, real estate, and hedge funds. A new apartment building called Miller Hill Lofts will be built adjacent to Miller Hill Manor near Miller Mall in Duluth. The $13 million project will feature multifamily housing targeting households making between $27,000 and $50,000 a year. There will be 28 one-bedroom units and 44 two-bedroom apartments. Duluth officials helped developer PLB Properties obtain a $1 million state grant. New housing availability for young workers is considered a priority by companies that are expanding in the Duluth area. Minnesota Department of Natural Resources officials were expected to rule late this week on the Polymet Mine Environmental Impact Statement. If approved, Polymet would be the first full-scale non-ferrous mining project in Minnesota. That ruling was expected to be issued Thursday after our show was recorded. Regardless of whether the mine is approved or not, observers expect lawsuits to be filed based on the state's decision. For more on these, on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on this week's show, now is the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. Visit the WDSE website for the latest updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, or to pledge your support of public television online. And Pat, thank you so much for filling in this week. It's always great to, to work with you. Good to see you and the crew here at Channel 8 again. Always nice to be back. Yeah, and fun to see that excerpt of the, the Glen oh, show coming I gave up. tours there for 20 years. That's a lot of nostalgia there for me, too. Very fun. And Almanac North will be off the next two Fridays for that membership drive. So join us again on Friday, March 25th for an update on news and events in the region. For Pat and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you next time. Thank you.